Well, I'll try to make the uh, introduction brief, even though Marsha has done amazing things um, for a very long time. Uh, Marsha, Professor Marsha Riki is a Regents Professor of Astronomy at the University of Arizona. And uh, she's basically one of the, um, essentially founding members of infrared astronomy and has made tremendous contributions to that. And um, during that time, uh, during the time from which she got her PhD in MIT, uh, she has worked on many infrared uh, projects, trying to focus on studying galaxy evolution, active galactic nuclei, and particularly with James Webb Space Telescope, the most distant galaxies in the universe that we're just starting to see with this spectacular new observatory. So uh, she was very deeply involved in developing infrared detectors, uh, imaging arrays, and she was the deputy PI of a major new infrared instrument for the Hubble Space Telescope, the Near Infrared Camera and Multi-Object Spectrograph, known as NICMOS. And um, she has worked uh, tirelessly on the James Webb NearCam project, uh, I would argue the primary camera that was required to even get the observatory operational as a uh, principal investigator for a long period of time. I know how hard it was <laughs> while I was a PhD student having seen her work so tirelessly to make this project a success. And um, without further ado, Marsha, please take it away. Thank you very much, Suresh, and I know that for part of your work at Arizona, you suffered from my being too busy to talk to you often enough. <laughs> All right, I, I'm one of the few people that can wear their data, but I have to say, now that I've um, shown it off, it's just warm enough I'm gonna take it off. <laughs> and of course, that's saying something. Uh, a person from Arizona thinking that it's warm means it's warm. <laughs> Okay, so um, I described this, this image a little bit yesterday. Um, it's an infrared image comprised of six different filter images, each one assigned to a different color to make this visually appealing. You know, it looks like a sky with some kind of cliffs or something, and to highlight some of the astronomy. So for those that like bow shocks, there's one due to some emission from gas being pushed out of a protostar. And the, the so-called clear sky actually is clear in a sense because the hot bright stars that were formed out of the interstellar material up here have actually um, destroyed or blown away a lot of the gas and dust. And you can actually sort of see kind of a rim here where those hot stars are starting to eat into the cloud of material down here that will eventually form some more stars. So that's what that picture is all about. Now, <clears throat> here are my collaborators. This is a little bit of a joke, but only partly. All told, there were nearly 20,000 people that worked on the Webb Telescope project at one time or another. And we, we never had a meeting where all 20,000 showed up because, of course, some worked on, on an early phase, some worked on a later phase. This was a meeting in 2005 when a lot of people involved with the telescope and the instruments at least came together. And, of course, that meant that it was a multinational meeting. And it meant that trying, this was a picture taken at Goddard Space Flight Center and anyone, even from Canada, who's tried to visit a U.S. government facility knows that a lot of people had to file a lot of paperwork to be able to get there. And I'm actually in this picture, and I'm in this picture, trying to remember, right there. So you can't identify me, but I am there. Oh, and I should mention that this was um, a full-scale model of the Webb Telescope that Northrop Grumman made, who is the prime contractor, that they made for PR purposes. They carried it around to a, a, a number of different venues, and it's made out of stuff you'd buy down at the hardware store. So won't get won't collect you any data. <laughs> this is my 
much closer team of collaborators. This is the NIRCAM science team. These are the people that helped me write the original proposal that we filed in response to a NASA announcement of opportunity that gave us the chance to build the instrument. And you will notice that there are a number of Canadians in here, including your very own Peter Martin, whom I've known for a very long time. And the Canadian participation was, has an interesting history because when we proposed to build NIRCAM, NIRCAM was going to be partly built in the United States and partly built in Canada. And any of you who've ever heard of some rather ugly laws in the United States whose nickname is ITAR, which stands for International Trade in arms regulations, you might wonder, why would a science project have anything to do with that? If it's launched in space, these laws apply. And that meant that if we were going to discuss with our um, Canadian partners almost any of the details, it was not going to be allowed. And so just uh, about a year and a half into the formal part of the project after 2002, the project manager said, you know, it would make a whole lot more sense if NIRCAM was built in the U.S. and the Canadians built the fine guidance sensor, which they had, they had already signed up to do, and build another instrument that would, have duplicate, that would replicate some of the capability that was going to be built into NIRCAM. So we each have our own pile. We don't have to worry about ITAR, and we can get on with it. And I think from a management perspective, that was the right choice. But I made a lot of Canadian friends, some of whom stayed on the team, and some of whom from um, the Canadian aerospace companies stayed with the project, and I got to know um, all through the time of working on JWST. So there's a little bit of history to all of this. And I have to mention, two of my team members passed away before launch, which was, you know, gives you a sense of how long this project took. Um, unfortunate that they didn't get to see these pretty pictures. All right, so um, we launched Christmas Day 2021, and we launched from um, Kourou, which is where Ariane Space has their launch facility in French Guiana. And the rocket was the major, the biggest single contribution from the European Space Agency. And this was the best rocket by far, most reliable, had the right lift capability, and we could talk to the French pretty well. So that was good. And here you can see what happened after launch, the 10 days of terror while everything was unfolding and all those single point failures that many things that could have gone wrong to prevent things from unfolding. And so we got to our six and a half meter diameter telescope mirror and all five layers of the sun shield, whose longest dimensions are about like the dimensions of a tennis court, all got unfolded properly. And I was kind of worried about the sun shield because when you see it, in, when I saw it in real life, it's rather like a luminized mylar kind of stuff that you'd get as a space blanket at the hiking store to use if there's an emergency to keep you warm. It's very thin, floppy material deployed using cables and pulleys. And that's not the nicest way to do things in space, but that's what that sun shield required. Okay, so here's a clearer view of the telescope. So you can see the 18 mirror segments in the primary mirror, and everything above this top layer of the sun shield is approximately um, 40 to 50 kelvins. The instruments have some extra radiators that get them a little bit colder. And the mid-infrared instrument actually has a cryo cooler because its detectors want to run a little bit above six degrees kelvin. And then everything underneath this bottom layer of the sun shield is at more or less room temperature. That's where there's the spacecraft, the communication system to the ground, um, the propulsion system that we need for station keeping at L2. And I should mention the Ariane space people did such a fantastic job of hitting exactly 
the launch window and angles and taking the wind into account, et cetera, et cetera, whatever you do to wind and launch a rocket. We've ended up with enough what we call station keeping fuel that the mission in principle could last for 25 years instead of the original five to 10. So all of the astronomers in the room should have a chance to apply if you're up to applying for things where there's seven times as much time requested as given out. Um, and what I then worry about is, okay, we have plenty of fuel, but our cryogenic mechanisms, which can't be lubricated with the usual grease because they would freeze and not move and have to have special lubricants, whether they will last for 25 years, I have pretty good faith that they will, but there's no guarantee that they will. So I think that's the next most vulnerable thing. And we have a very capable instrument suite. And as a person who worked on the Spitzer Space Telescope, this instrument suite is just absolutely incredible. We share the focal plane, which means indeed we can run instruments in parallel, which we often do as long as, say, uh, what we do frequently is align near spec on some interesting targets that we want spectra of, and then take near cam images um, at the adjacent area. And when you're searching for distant galaxies, that's a nice way to increase the number um, of distant galaxies you find because you've increased your area. And the precise pointing of near cam in that case is not exactly critical. And one of the things that's a bit of a limitation here is that we, we can't send arbitrarily large amounts of data to the ground because our telemetry system uses the deep space network, which NASA uses also for manned missions, missions to Mars, all kinds of things. And so we have our, our slots. And one could ask, why didn't NASA build us our own, tel our own telemetry station? But I don't actually know why they didn't, but they didn't. And I suspect it's infighting between different parts of NASA. I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> OK. So here's a picture of a deployment test of the sun shield. It took, uh, if you deployed this once in 1G, you have to have a lot of what are called gravity off offloading because this material is so flimsy that it can't hold itself up. And what you can't see in here really is that there's some plastic sheets under there to help hold it up so that it doesn't tear itself. And to pull it out and then fold it back up it takes um, over two months. And if this had taken, let's say for sake of argument, six months, we would have had a real problem because we wouldn't have been able to test it enough times. And one thing that was a little scary is that there was only one basically flawless de deployment of the sun shield during a test before launch. <laughs> And because that one was flawless, they said, okay, we can go ahead and launch. But that didn't make one necessarily feel totally happy. And this gives you a sense of uh, what the, you know, the, in a, in, one can think of these sunshield layers almost like acting like waveguides to um, dump the heat out into space. And so uh, it turns out that we kept the heat load from the rest of the facility low enough that we almost had to um, worry about heating the instruments back up a little bit, but we hit a good median. And this just shows why we had to have everything fold up, because this is the outline of an Ariane 5 nose cone. And obviously, you can't launch like that, it wouldn't work. And so then you fold it up, all works fine. And the clearances inside that nose cone are quite tight, or were quite tight. And there was a lot of calculation done to make certain that the launch vibrations wouldn't cause um, anything to be bumping onto the walls of the nose cone. And the other thing that ended up being a worry was that there's uh, enough atmosphere trans, uh, trapped in here that when you get up um, far enough into space and you start separating from the rest of the rocket, there would be a pressure differential and, and gas trapped in here that, again, things could rip apart. And there were various um, remediations put in place, and obviously those all worked. So we assembled things at Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. 
moved it to a north moved it to Houston and this is a picture of the thermal vacuum chamber in Houston that was originally built to test the lunar rover you can tell it's quite big by the size of the people here and a lot of refurbishment had to be done for this because it was not built to be um, operated at 40 Kelvin. It was meant to simulate the moon's surface, which, yeah, so the vacuum part was right, but the moon's surface is <coughs> too warm. So many um, cryogenic shields and things had to be added. And this gives you a sense of how um, Webb fits in. And there was what we affectionately called the chandelier that had various optical sources so we could inject light and test that the optical path was working correctly and that we could adjust all of the segments properly. And this very sort of kind of magenta thing was the final um, shield that made, ensured that the um, instruments, which are down in here, would get down to the 40 Kelvin operating temperature. So it was this particular item uh, required extra cooling and there was both liquid helium and cryo coolers involved in doing that. And we stayed uh, at Houston for over, the test took almost a hundred days. And in the middle of the test, more or less, Hurricane Harvey hit, which was not a good time. And, but the telescope was very safe because this vacuum chamber is extremely strong. And so if you had to have a hurricane come when you have valuable equipment, having it inside a chamber is good. We weren't inside the chamber though, and we had to drive through a fair bit of water. Nobody got hurt though. Okay, so then we go off to Northrop Grumman, attach the sun shield. There we are all packed up for transport to um, Kourou. And then we launch, and now I'll talk to you a little bit about when you launch something that's folded up and you unfold it, and of course you're unfolding it after it's been shaken a whole lot. The area and space vibration spectrum um, has a lot of energy at relatively low frequencies that could cause resonances and so on, and all of that was checked ahead of time. But nonetheless, a lot of parts were subjected to forces of nine or 10 Gs. So they, they got shaken around a lot. And so the first part of commissioning was getting everything deployed. And NIRCAM itself didn't get turned on for, uh, this says 35.8 days, but we, we um, decided to start earlier because we got down to 100 Kelvin, which is where the detectors would first sense light. And we turned on and we started rounding up the 18 images from the 18 mirror segments. And then we went into this quite long period where an OTE, by the way, stands for optical telescope element. There are so many acronyms on this project that um, early on, a couple of my postdocs made an acronym dictionary, put it on the web. And you want to know who liked using it? People at NASA headquarters. So. <laughs> So, and what's really bad is that a few of the acronyms were used for two different reasons, so you had to judge by context. Anyway, instead of just calling it the telescope, it's the optical telescope element. So this was where we went from these 18 mirror segments pointing in whatever direction they ended up after the launch vibrations, and they got lifted off some uh, I like to think of them as rubber, but they weren't actually rubber. They were compliant snubbers that, that they could bounce against during the launch, and then they got lifted up by about 12 millimeters above those so that we could control them. And then once we had the telescope turned into a lovely, aligned, perfect, nearly perfect telescope, we started um, checking out the um, instruments. And we took turns so that one instrument would get a bunch of data and people associated with that instrument could go off and analyze it and another instrument would, would take data. And so we tried to make certain that we proceeded as efficiently as we could. And so we went, I'll show some more details of this, going from the 18 separate images to this beautifully aligned telescope. And so those are sort of another way of just saying these three phases of the commissioning. Now, this whole little ch 
chart goes through the various steps involved in taking those 18 segments and getting them to act as a single smooth telescope. And a lot of planning and simulation, and we actually had a 1 6th scale model of the mirror that was used in t to test algorithms. So uh, an enormous amount of planning went into how to do this. Um, what would happen if a segment couldn't be moved? Could you still align the rest? All kinds of things with, you know, were there some degenerate modes that would trick you? Would you get end up in a local minimum, but the telescope could be made better? It turned out it, it was great that we did all that planning, but things actually went pretty straightforwardly. None of the bad things that could have happened, happened. So the first thing was to find the segments, and then we got the secondary mirror kind of tweaked up. Then we had to identify which, one, which image was actually which physical segment, so that when we sent commands, we were adjusting the segment that we thought we were adjusting. And then we had to do some other alignments. We had to stack up the images. And at this point, you know, it looks like you've got, you know, kind of a single star, but it's actually 18 images piled on top of each other, but they're not phased up. So it's still acting as though it's a telescope whose diameter is 1.35 meters, the size of a single segment. So the signal is 18 segments worth, but the spatial resolution is not. And so we went through um, a, a two-step process of phasing, one part called coarse phasing, where it was estimated that the segments might be out of focus with respect to each other by um, a few hundred um, microns, potentially. And then once we got, we used some, uh, a special device called the dispersed Hartman sensor, and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. And once we got through getting things close to phased up, then we used a process we dubbed fine phasing that went from this post coarse phasing to a beautiful point spread function indicative of a telescope with a diameter of six and a half meters. And the, the procedure here in fine phasing and the algorithms and the mathematics are closely related to what are used in adaptive optics on the ground. And a number of the people that were members of the wavefront sensing team had backgrounds in doing um, wavefront sensing. And so this, this part of the game was pretty well understood um, long before we ever got the, very far in this project. And this fine phasing step gets repeated whenever the segments start to drift apart a little bit, which they, they do over time because of varying thermal environments as we slew around the sky and so on. And at the moment, we take fine phasing data every other day, and then if the encircled energy in a small aperture has drifted by more than 2%, then we go and go, go through the full um, mirror adjustment uh, sequence. And right now we're only having to do that about every 20 days. And I keep wondering if we're going to relax how often we take the data. But at the moment, that's the game plan. And I should mention there was another step that we only did once called multi-instrument, multi-field data. And the idea here is that everything up to this point near the end was done strictly through NIRCAM, which is near the center of field of view. And it was conceivable that one could have a degeneracy between um, a field, uh, a tilt of the primary mirror and an offset of the secondary. And so this was to get rid of that, but it proved that we, it, it, it was almost uh, essentially non-existent problem. And we skipped the second, second version. So to um, show you what the optical path looks like, so here's our primary mirror. And JWST is um, a three mirror and a stigmat. And you can see, okay, here's one mirror, two mirrors. And 
actually, um, this tertiary mirror is, is the actual third one in the, in the three mirrors. And this design was chosen because that gives a, a relatively wide corrected field of view. And so, um, although no one instrument has a big field of view, the overall territory of plus minus nine arc minutes is a fairly large field for a telescope of this size. And this fine steering mirror is a very critical component that's actually connected um, electrically, so to speak, to the fine guidance sensor. So when we're pointing at a target, the fine guidance sensor is looking at a star um, nearby in the field of view and taking um, 16 hertz data and keeping that, um, measuring where that, the centroid of that star is and sending an error signal, signal to this fine steering mirror to make certain that everything stays perfectly aligned. And this scheme is working so well that we had a special mode of near cam where we could take data um, at nearly a, um, a kilohertz to look at what the jitter might be. And the jitter is less than one milliarc second. And knowing that near cam's pixels are 30 milliarc seconds, we're right at, <laughs> at the edge of what we could measure even. So the scheme has worked beautifully and that contributes to the excellent image quality. And there's a couple of other details if you like focal lengths and so forth. And we used this pupil imaging capability some during alignment to make certain that nothing was going haywire, which it didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, let me talk a little bit about how this dispersed Hartman sensor works. And I'll show a picture of a real one momentarily. But basically, if you have two mirror segments that are adjacent to each other, if there's a focus step between them, if you interfere the light from those two segments, you can measure what the difference is in, in height. So that's this delta L here, and it goes through um, a slit, basically, and a grism here that interferes the light, and so you get a pattern on the near cam detector, you go through the math, and so by measuring this interference pattern, you can essentially back out what is the delta in height between the mirror segments. And this just shows some, some data from a long time ago when this was being devised. And the slope of these fringes that you see tells you whether you're positive out of focus or negative out of focus. So you know which way to move. This shows what some of the data actually looks like. This was from a very early test using optical wavelengths. So here's um, what one physically looks like. And near cam actually has two of these. And one of them, you can see these kind of magenta rectangles. And that's the opening that accepts the light from these two segments and interferes them. And then if you count up, there are um, 10 of these. And then you can see some in magenta that bridge other pairs. There's another 10. And with these 20 interference signals, you can fully well, not quite as accurately as we need in the end, but you can come close to completely phasing up the 18 mirror segments. There's enough redundancy when you have 20 measurements. Here's a sample of actual data on near cam, and this was, um, this was used in series with a filter that has notches to provide the wavelength calibration, which you need to actually convert the interference pattern into a physical distance. And so that is how we did this coarse phasing. And then the fine phasing, we, it's called focus diverse um, phasing. And we take in and out of focus images. And I have to say, we don't move the secondary mirror during this process. We do the defocus by putting um, what we call weak lenses, lenses that have a power of only a, a few waves, um, into the beam in the near cam pupil. And so there's a, a little sequence of images, and those are taken on orbit, sent to the ground, analyzed, and then you can back out how you need to adjust the different mirror segments. And that has worked absolutely gorgeously and works better on orbit than people um, had hoped it would. And it's, right, it's, it's performing right at the limit of what one could, could, ex could possibly expect. 
So that's how we produced this lovely diffraction limited image of a star. And I think yesterday I showed that ah, those little blips in the background were not noise, but were actually galaxies. And galaxies show up all the time in JWST data. Thankfully, that's why we build it. OK, so here are some plots that show um, the encircled energy as a function of the size of the, of the aperture that you're using to extract the signal um, in terms of pixels. And this is a chart now that just, this is the, the measured full width half maximum. And this was from a set of data where we made several measurements. And you can, this is uh, another criterion that, theoretical criterion that one could use. It's not actually this, exactly the same as full width half maximum, but it's closely related. And you can see that we had, we, the requirement was to be diffraction limited at two microns, and the pixel sampling was set to do critical sampling at that wavelength with five pixels across the diameter of the first airy ring. And so the, this um, full width half max is slightly better, indicating that the performance was better, but we're close. Down here, you can see more scatter at 0.7 microns, I should say that these filter designations are the central wavelength um, times 100. So that's the wavelength in microns times 100. So this is 0.7 microns, um, are, or 700 nanometers, if you like, our shortest wavelength. And here, what limits our spatial resolution is the fact that we didn't, we never dreamed we would be this good, so we never, uh, we didn't include enough pixels to sample that point spread function correctly. Um, so we, we, cur we get around that by doing what astronomers call dithering. We'll take slightly different pointings and get um, different um, positionings across the, the pixel to recover some of the spatial resolution. But this chart kind of summarizes this telescope optically is working beyond belief. So if anyone ever thought a segmented telescope couldn't work, forget it, they can work great. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I, I mentioned this yesterday. Um, a less than micron sized piece of um, interstellar dust hit us, made a little dent. And, you know, the original requirement was for the wavefront area of the telescope to be 135 nanometers. We came out at 50 nanometers at that initial beautiful alignment image. And this caused a degradation to 60 nanometers. So not bad. And we hope we don't, it, a whole year now has gone by without any more things like that happening. Okay, then we move on to science. This is um, a little, a, a relatively nearby collection of galaxies. This is a much more distant collection of galaxies that President Biden insisted on showing. And this is a spectrum showing water vapor in the um, atmosphere of an exoplanet. And these were all early release observations. This is a galaxy that suffered a collision, poor thing. Um, and I should mention that this spectrum showing the water vapor was taken by the nearest instrument, which is um, one of the Canadian, the, the Canadian science instrument. So before I go into my, my personal favorite topic, let me talk a little bit about one of the other science areas that's playing a big role on Webb. And this is transit observations of exoplanets. And there are two principal ways to look at exoplanets. One is to use a coronagraph or some other method to null out the starlight and look for faint objects nearby that would be exoplanets. Or you can look for uh, an exoplanet to go um, to be orbiting in nearly our viewing plane, and so it either occults the star or gets eclipsed by the, go, by the star. And you, by studying those, you can learn things. And this method is best suited for Webb. There are experiments that are going to do some direct imaging. We may even be able to get a spectrum. But this method um, primarily requires a stable environment and lots of photons. 
and Webb is good on both of those. In fact, it's, mu it's a more stable environment than we would have predicted. And so this scheme where you take data when the exoplanet is in front of the star and light gets filtered through its atmosphere if it has one, um, and then you take data when the planet's over here and you can just get the starlight, you can difference them, then you can learn a lot. And you can also learn a lot if you use the mid-infrared instrument and get the thermal emission from this exoplanet before it, it gets hidden behind the star. And so this is one of the um, relatively early on um, exoplanet spectra. And I think as time goes by and you know, these, these events have to be done at a particular time because obviously the, <laughs> the planet has to be in front of the star. It can't be some random time. So these have to be scheduled carefully. And the data on these are beginning to accumulate now that we've been doing this for a while and people are learning that it works great. And there are a number of um, molecules indicated here and I think I mentioned sulfur dioxide yesterday, which is a non-equilibrium um, molecule, and no one had predicted that it would be there because you can see this blue line that was the uh, uh, kind of the original model. It doesn't, it doesn't much account for that. So we'll see what else comes up. And I should mention that this um, particular exoplanet is what is called a hot Jupiter. So it's a big exoplanet. Um, and it's hot because it's close to its primary star. So it's not one where one would go looking for evidence of life, but it's one where we can start to learn about what affects exoplanet atmospheres and so on. And for the future, we'd love to get one that looks like this that would tell us we found an Earth-like atmosphere. And this is a very hard observation because if you calculate um, what fraction of the sun's light would be blocked out by the Earth passing in front of the sun? It's not very much. And in fact, this kind of an observation would require stability at the level of not very many parts per million. And so when we find a suitably bright candidate, we'll have to do a number of these transits and co-add them to get enough signal to noise to get a good spectrum. And no one has proposed to do that in this first round because it's obviously a hard, a hard measurement. But if we last for 25 years, I bet we're gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Another thing that has um, been done is looking at the environment in the exoplanet solar system. Our own solar system has an asteroid belt, has a Kuiper belt, has an Oort cloud, so there's a number of different kinds of material floating around in the na <coughs> neighborhood of the planets. And this is a, a Hubble Space Telescope picture with a coronagraph. And that, this central thing is where the naked eye star Fomalhaut was blotted out by a coronagraphic mask. And you can see there's some residual light. But this ring is... Um, a dust ring out at something more like the distance of the Kuiper belt in the solar system, which is out beyond Pluto. And it's being seen in reflected starlight. And so we, we've known about these so-called debris disks for some time. Um, they were first discovered with the IRAS satellite in the 1980s. But just a couple days ago, a beautiful JWST image was released, and this was taken with the mid-infrared instrument. So you are seeing, all of what you're seeing here is emission from the dust particles. And so you can see the same ring that was seen in reflection using um, Hubble, but Hubble did not see these um, inner rings where the dust is heated up and um, this, innermost belt here is probably most akin to our asteroid belt. And this is the, f the first time that this kind of structure has been seen in a debris disk. And uh, I have to tell you that um, th this was fun because 
I'm married to the U.S. Miri PI, so, and it was his, his team that did this, so it was nice that they got to have some good press, too. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, he was a PI on Spitzer, so he, he was okay with me being a bigger shot on this one. So. <laughs> All right, so speaking of the mid-infrared instrument, Miri, these are both pictures of a region in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which has got lots of stars and interstellar gas and whatnot. This is an image from the Spitzer instrument at a wavelength of eight microns. This is Webb's Miri instrument at 7.7 .7 microns, in other words, basically the same wavelength. And you can see what a huge difference having a big telescope as opposed to a telescope of 85 centimeters. Spitzer's primary mirror was smaller than one segment of JWST. So Webb is, of course, a lot more sensitive. But one of the key things here is the much greater detail. And when you're an extragalactic astronomer, that's really important because if I showed you um, some Spitzer images with the same image with near camera Miri of some distant galaxies. You can't tell for sure which object in the Spitzer image is what you're seeing in the web images. And this increase in spatial resolution is helping a lot with understanding these distant galaxies. Speaking of which, um, studying the distant universe was the original motivation for building web. In the very early days, it was called the first light machine, which was a terrible name because we can't detect the, uh, you know, the first star, even if it's a population three ultra-luminous star. I did a calculation, and I think you needed um, a telescope of order 30 kilometers across to detect one star. Forget it, we're not going there. So when, I, when we now say that we're detecting the first things, we mean the first aggregate of stars. We might be able to detect something that would become a globular cluster today, but small galaxies are kind of the, the, the presumed things that you would detect. And we haven't quite gotten to Z of 15. We've for sure gotten to Z of 13.2, as I will show you momentarily. But I bet by the time we're done, this will get eclipsed. And in fact, this is that early release observation uh, of SMAX 0723, which is this cluster here that causes lensing. And there were some targets chosen for spectroscopy. And this one is at the lowest redshift. Um, I'm trying to remember. This is of order uh, Z of 8 or 9, and it goes up to uh, no, this was like Z of 7 or 6 and gets up to Z of 8 or 9. I forget the exact numbers. And you can see these emission lines progressing across the near-spec spectrum. And this was great. It demonstrated this stuff all worked. But what was more interesting was if you studied these spectra carefully, what you see highlighted here in these is um, an oxygen line that is at a wavelength. It's an... Um, uh, 3730, um, 3729. And what's special about this is that that can be used to estimate how many heavy elements have already been formed and injected into the interstellar medium in that galaxy. And it doesn't require many um, uh, assumptions. It's called a direct measure of metallicity. And the fact that this is being detected like this means that if we go back and take similar spectra of, of galaxies as a function of redshift, we can trace out how we go from the very early universe that's just basically only hydrogen and helium and a little bit of other stuff all the way to the kind of heavy element content we find in the sun now, which is one of the goals, but that's something that requires acquiring a lot of spectra and analysis, and we don't we, we don't have all the data yet, but this shows the promise um, of the method. So what my, my own favorite project is, and that I've, my team and I have invested um, nearly half of our guaranteed time into this 
what we call JADES, JWST Advanced Deep Survey that we're doing in collaboration with the Near Spec Guaranteed Time Team. And we're doing two regions on the sky, two famous regions, um, what we call Goods South and Goods North, which is also the original Hubble Deep Field. And all these different squares show different pointings of either near cam or near spec, or we also have a, a small miri part. And we're running, most of the time, we're running near cam and near spec in parallel with each other. So we're doubling the amount of data that we're getting. And as you might expect, it takes a lot of people to do that, um, many of whom are students and are cutting their teeth on these data. And I should make another advertisement that the very, you can barely tell, but there is a red region here along with some blue overlay, which the blue overlay is near spec, the red is near cam, and we're going to release those data um, in June um, ahead of the end of our proprietary period so that astronomers everywhere can prepare for cycle three and have some actual data to practice with. So the idea is we take images, we find interesting sources, and then lay out a pattern of slits in near spec, which um, is a multi-object spectrometer with electrically programmable, and uh, to be honest, pain in the neck to figure out where to open them up slits, but um, it works, and you can get 200 or so spectra at once, and so you can take many tens of thousands of seconds of exposure because you can get enough galaxies at once that you can afford to spend that much time. And this shows you a sample where this, this is a sample of near cam data. And you can see that it disappears at 0.9 microns because um, in this particular object, the Lyman edge is right here and so the universe short word of that is completely opaque because the photons get absorbed by the hydrogen in the universe. And this break was one of the things that was realized um, back in the 1990s as why we had to go to the infrared. Not just that wavelengths all get shifted to the infrared, but you essentially run out of the ability to see them with Hubble because they, their light is all absorbed. And so that was one of the key arguments for proceeding with Webb. Here's another sample um, near spec spectrum. And uh, those near the front can start to see, you know, here's the 5007 doublet, lots of lines in here, H delta, all kinds of stuff being seen at redshifts never studied before, because you can't do this from the ground. The background is too bright. And then as we proceeded with our project, we got some deep imaging, we processed it, we picked out four objects right away that we knew would be high redshift, we inspected them. And the reason we only chose these four, rather than, we, we have a catalog with many, many, many more. But when we got these, this first imaging, we knew that it, shortly, um, we were going to be using near spec. And the original plan was that the, the initial near spec would all do Hubble sources that had been found you know, years before. But uh, the near spec um, time got delayed because near spec has a flaw that occasionally when you open a, one of these slits, there can be an electrical short and you get some extra glow and you have to go through a procedure to clear it. That happened on an observation just before ours, so our observations were delayed a little bit. We pulled four sources off the list that were in this one particular area, substituted these four that we had evidence from near CAM of being at redshifts higher than 10, plugged them in, and bingo, they all were at high redshift. And this shows the imaging um, of not the highest redshift one next to the highest. The middle row shows um, a fit to the images, and this is the residuals. This shows um, where we think the, the alignment break is, and the, the two different colors of 
photometry symbols here. There are two different ways of measuring photometry. One where you just plunk down a circle, count up how bright it is inside. And the other is this um, scheme of fitting, um, doing, using Bayesian fitting and assuming Sursich profiles and figuring out um, and being able to deblend things in a more systematic way rather than just plunking down a circle and counting up everything inside. And so you can, the line is a, a fit using um, a program called Bro Prospector, which is another Bayesian fitting program that tries to um, calculate what collection of stars will match your data. And so this shows um, the four sources that we put in, and these redshifts um, are the actual spectroscopic redshifts, and you notice this one up here at 13.2, that's the record holder, and I'll show you um, a rather scuzzy looking but real spectrum with the Lyman edge that proves it's, it's at that redshift. And something that we had trouble impressing on the referee was that if you look at the red line under here, which is a possible um, output of a collection of stars, you will notice there are no bright emission lines in that wavelength region, and that's just life. There are a lot just beyond the end of what near spec can measure. And unfortunately, this particular source is too faint to try with MIRI. But we didn't see any bright emission lines because we didn't expect to see any. And so we're going by this break. And in fact, the photometric redshifts have been by and large working very well. So photometric redshift for those of you that are not aficionados or when you um, take your photometry in as many filters as hopefully you have, as you can have, and take a series of different stellar populations and vary both the collection of stars and their redshift till you find the best fit. And there are always some outliers. This is a comparison of a redshift measured spectroscopically with um, photometric redshifts from our data. And this panel is ones where the spectroscopic redshift was maybe questionable quality, low signal to noise. This is a plot where they're much better. And we discovered that a lot of the outliers here are from a MUSE experiment on the, on the ground using um, uh, basically looking at lines in the ultraviolet. And there's some positional problems. And so we, we think some of these mismatches are because we're not associating our source correctly with the MUSE source. And here are the, the photometric uh, error distributions for our th four high redshift guys. These are the actual spectra with a dashed line showing where the line and break is. And this guy is, is the record holder. It's kind of a scuzzy spectrum because it was right at the edge and we only got one dither position. We didn't get the full exposure time. So in the future, we'll do better. And I, I won't even bet you how long this will stay the record. It'll, get, it'll be eclipsed soon by someone else's uh, source. This one, this spectrum, is one that I just love. Because this is at a redshift of 10.6. This is not something nearby. And you can see, here's the, the Lyman break. And you can see it's very nice signal to noise. You can see um, a little bit of a kind of an edge here that is a damping wing. And there's a whole collection of lovely emission lines because it's still low enough redshift and we have high enough signal to noise that we can see these. And this object was actually originally detected in HST data because it is extra bright we're still trying to ferret out why it's so bright. It, we don't think it's gravitationally lensed, but detailed study of this nitrogen four line, for example, suggests that even though these lines are not, you know, this was a low resolution spectrum, so you can't really tell, but we don't see um, lines of a width that would suggest it being um, an AGN, but, but I think the jury's still open on that, and we'll have to, have to see where that plays out. But, just amazing to see this quality of data only a few hundreds of millions of years after the Big Bang. And 
note that this line here is magnesium, which implies there are some generations of stars have already come, have come and gone because you don't get magnesium from the Big Bang. This is not primordial. So let me um, finish out here by describing a little bit about um, something that's made a lot of press. There have been a number of very bright, relatively bright galaxies found already in web data at what we think are high redshifts. And before Webb launched, it looked like that if you measured the star formation rate as a function of time, that it was just dropping, 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 we probably wouldn't see that many really high redshift galaxies. Well, what we, this was a paper by Richard Bowens using some data that was released publicly, and you can see there's a hint of some things at Z of 14. This was slightly speculative because this was not based on data with a lot of filters, but it was quite suggestive that uh, things were not dropping as fast as predicted earlier. And other things, um, this is now a pair of plots showing either the cumulative number density of um, galaxies and or the, um, the most massive object is a function of redshift, and there, there's that extra bright guy. And if you end up in this grayed out area, um, it's not, you'd be basically kind of um, violating um, lambda CDM and how galaxies might form if you ended up here. And these lines are similar limits, uh, again, for what you might expect from lambda CDM galaxy formation. And more recently, um, a paper taking into account these points, which were measured from some web imaging. And these epsilons are the star formation efficiency. And you can think of this as uh, this axis as either being the mass of stars or a measure of the dark, <coughs> the dark matter halo mass times the fraction of, um, light, of mass that would, could be found in baryons in that halo in a star formation efficiency. And we think from other lines of evidence that this F sub B, the cosmic baryon fraction, is a little bit under 16%. And you can see these three curves of star formation efficiency. And these two web points are rather close to the 100% efficiency line. And in the Milky Way, the star formation efficiency is more like 10 or 20%. And so this is the uh, plots like this are why there are these um, discussions going around that Webb is breaking lambda CDM or breaking cosmology. Well, let's take a look at that. Um, so we need at least a good factor of two to get the star formation efficiency down to something more plausible. And so I've listed some of the um, possible ex explanations. One is maybe the star formation just is more efficient at early times because the densities are higher. Um, maybe lambda CDM is incorrect or needs modification. This is always the journalist's favorite choice. Um, Maybe the initial mass function needs modification. And if you go and look at the papers that are computing the masses assumed for these objects, where we measure how bright they are, that's pretty straightforward. But to convert that brightness into a mass of stars when we have no other information aside from the brightness and maybe the brightness at a handful of wavelengths, you need to make an assumption of how brightness translates into a number of stars. And of course, stars come in a vast range of sizes. And the initial mass function is telling us how many in each mass bin might be formed when a cloud fragments. And within the Milky Way, that seems to be, there seems to be a more or less uniform prescription for how that happens with relatively few high mass stars and lots of low mass stars. Now, if we, um, and these are the names of some of these um, 
prescriptions, which basically are rather similar. And if you look at these initial mass functions in detail, most of the light that comes out of the group of stars that they predict, that they predict comes from stars um, more massive th than the sun and higher. But um, these stars only represent of order 62% of the mass. And if, as you move the lower mass end of this up, you still can get a lot of luminosity and, and cut down on how much mass. And there is a physical reason to think that the initial mass function might be different at high redshift, which is, you know, locally, the kind of minimum temperature that you can achieve out in space is three degrees from the cosmic microwave background. But if you go to a high redshift, you take, say, redshift 10, and that temperature changes by 10 plus 1, or a factor of 11. So instead of 3 degrees, it'll be 33 degrees. And it will take a much bigger collection of gas to collapse and form a star. And so um, there's, in my, my book, this seems like a very likely probability. Um, this number 4 was appropriate when um, this stuff was first coming out because the initial near cam photometric calibration wasn't so good, but that's a pretty small factor. And some people suggested that maybe where those two points came from were atypical. I don't think so. We're starting to see lots of these. And I think it's more like something like this or some combination of, say, um, one. Oh, I see I, my numbering got messed up. Anyway, one and three. <laughs> So if the reporter asks you, is JWST changing cosmology and breaking lambda cedium, tell them to be skeptical. Whoops. OK, so I'll touch on a couple of other interesting things that have come out of the early spectroscopy. One of these um, galaxies that was done in our first batch of spectra is what we would call um, a uh, quiescent galaxy. It doesn't show any strong emission lines. And it shows um, what we call the Balmer break, which comes about if you have some um, somewhat older stars. And so the fact that this is a, a so-called quiescent, not star-forming galaxy, we would call it a, a, a red dead elliptical if we saw it nearby, um, is somewhat remarkable. And its mass is relatively low compared to nearby galaxies with these um, characteristics. And my suspicion is that this is an example of an object that's quiescent now, will accrete some more gas, and will probably go back into a star-forming phase. And we just happen to catch it at a lucky, lucky time. Another very interesting observation from this first batch was a discovery of a galaxy at z of 6.7, or you know, less than a gig a year after the Big Bang, that if you look at its spectrum, this is now showing the rest frame wavelengths, and if you look at this region, you see that there is an absorption. This is an absorption feature we know well from the local group of galaxies. It's called, caused by graphite or carbonaceous grains, by carbon. And to get enough carbon to make this large an absorption feature so early in the universe is pushing what stellar evolution can do in the sense that these grains are thought to be formed in the local air universe by in the outer atmospheres of what we call asymptotic giant branch stars, which are stars somewhat more massive than the sun that have used up their core hydrogen and are expanding as red giants. And they form some of these materials in their outer envelope. Another speculation is that maybe this is produced in a supernova, because we know that you could get carbon in a supernova remnant. But to usually, in the local universe, that kind of production, some of the reverse shocks from the supernovae destroy the carbon. So it's, this is um, a bit of a mystery, again. And they, these authors took some of the other spectra uh, in this, from the same batch and shifted them all to a common redshift and co-added them. And they see um, evidence that this stack of spectra also shows this feature, although much more weakly. 
So it's not like this is some, something totally screwy. It's just a big surprise. No one had predicted seeing, seeing this kind of um, behavior. So I'll just summarize by saying this thing is working great. Start writing your proposals. Cycle three proposals are due in October. Place your bets now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No one has made a comprehensive, a comprehensive model of both changes in metallicity and the IMF. And we actually don't yet have enough high quality, high redshift metallicity um, measurements. But come back in two or three years, and I think we're going to be able to have, see whether we have a consistent model or not. Because we'll need more spectra than we have to be able to do that. But, but we know the metallicity is less. So right, but is the, that accounted for in the prediction that makes the star formation rate seem so high? I, I would not want to say yes or no right now. I need to need to look at it some more. But I think um, the fact that we see all this carbon in something where um, that carbon would have come from three solar mass stars, I think it's not. There's nothing that's totally inconsistent yet. I'd say that. That's not such a big difference. Hello. Um, any ideas of how to test how the IMS is varying at high redshifts? Um, I wish I could give a really clear answer to that. Because um, when you do it to not so far away galaxies, you try to find a concordance between the dynamical mass that you can measure of the galaxy and the amount of light you see coming out. And then you can do some modeling to look for consistency. With these galaxies, at the very highest redshifts. Well, you saw the quality of those spectra. The GNZ 11 one that looked great, maybe one could have a hope of getting a dynamical mass by exposing long enough to see the stellar absorption lines. But I think it's basically hopeless for most of these high redshift galaxies to get an independent measure of the mass. And the stars less than of order three solar masses you just don't see in um, composite galaxy spectra unless you have you know, extremely high signal to noise and look for a very specific feature. It's just one of the bugaboos of extragalactic astronomy that you know, this was something I, I used to spend my life getting infrared spectra of nearby elliptical galaxies. And you, you could see the red giants, great, but forget everybody else. <laughs> So let me ask a provocative question. I mean, th this is spectacular. It's working far better than we had any right to expect. It's going to disrupt uh, all of our thinking about the future. But I wonder if in some ways it isn't yesterday's way of building large telescopes in space. You know, we're just on the cusp of, uh, you know, it being so much easier to get things up into near Earth orbit. I I'm wondering if in the future, uh, telescopes are going to look like JW, or if you, even if we're going to be building telescopes in this model, you know, maybe there are other ways to do it faster and cheaper. I hope you are right. And I was um, chair of the electromagnetic observation from space to cadal survey panel for optical IR. And so we were tasked with looking at what might be a successor to Webb, one of which was what I call Webb on steroids. Um, 15 meters across and a 50 meter sized sun shield. And when I asked them, how are you going to deploy t the t test the deployment of that? I didn't get a very good answer. 
But <clears throat> the real killer was it was nearly $20 billion. And right now, um, the US is basking in the glow of having well spent 10 billion, but asking 20 was mm. And so my panel um, basically came up with what would, might be um, a minimum sized telescope not built exactly like Webb necessarily, it could be a monolith. In fact, um, very likely would be a monolith because that's much cheaper to, to build. Um, that would look for habitable worlds, you know, Earth-like planets um, around nearby stars by direct imaging and visible light. Okay, that's fine. That's a semi-special purpose telescope. And we looked at some, some um, possibly creative ideas for how to do something else in the future. But I think that's where astronomers all around the world kind of need to put their thinking caps on because just going the same way is, it's too expensive and takes too long. And I mean, that was one of the other things we didn't like about this JWST on steroids was that any rational guess would have it not launching till 2045. Were we people in 2020 going to say what people in 2045 should be doing? No, that doesn't make any sense. So I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Not such a provocative question. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask one more thing, sorry, about this, uh, this baryonic excess. Um, presumably, the other explanation that doesn't involve the IMF you said was that disruptive feedback could be less, um, less disruptive at these early times. Yeah. And presumably, in principle, um, the details of early star formation could be revealed by kind of detailed um, morphology measurements of these early galaxies, like wh how, what's the density spike look like as a function of radius from the center of the galaxy and so on. How good are those measurements at early? At um, early uh, let, let's go back and take a look um, at these guys. Um, this is mm -hmm. a good example. Mm -hmm. If you take the characteristics of these, they're mm -hmm. basically unresolved point sources. And so trying to look for morphological variations just, again, Webb is good, sure. but not all okay. powerful. No, that's good to know. Great, thank you. Yep. In fact, the, that, these, that, that this particular object appeared to be unresolved was one of the arguments for maybe it's a dark star made out of dark matter uh, because it's unresolved. But I, you know, I like Katie Fries, and she's a smart lady, and it might be true, but I'm not putting my bets on that. <laughs> Without revealing too much, could you just give us an indication of what the how the successful observing proposals have been distributed with subject area, or you know, oh, high redshift um, galaxies, obviously planets. I Other didn't. Um, I didn't look at the statistics, but the list of um, successful proposals is already available at the Space Telescope website. So just Google it, and you'll find it. I can um, happily say that my team got another hundred hours to increase exposure in some of our medium band filters that make for better photometric redshifts, but I haven't paid a lot of attention past that. <laughs> He, you, you better protect him because he was on the tack and I'm sure he's, no. <laughs> Hi, so first let me just say thank you so much for all your hard work on this. Those of us here have had a chance to use the data. It's spectacular, You're, you've done such an amazing thing. You talked about the first light machine, um, which is interesting. Um, and a lot of us, we haven't been so ambitious potentially looking for the first stars, population three stars. Do you think there's any hope that you know, potentially if James Webb lasts 25 years, that we will actually detect population three stars? And if so, maybe how? I mean, I, didn't, I guess I didn't list this on one of the, as one of the possibilities, but if these very high redshift galaxies have a significant number of population three stars, that could be another argument for why they're so bright. But um, I have to say that the JWST Science Working Group in the old days used to have debates about how would we prove that we'd either seen a population three collection of stars or seen the first stars. And the most idiotic suggestion was, well, when we don't see anything further away. And I said, well, with my eye, Andromeda is the furthest thing I can see. Does that mean, no, forget that. 
And then there was a question of whether or not you could use lack of any um, spectral lines from heavy elements. But as you've seen at this one, when you get to a high enough redshift, near spec doesn't see any um, emission lines in particular. And trying to look for stellar absorption lines, is, you know, that's where the 25 years might help. But it will take, uh, you know, to, to um, say that we don't see any heavy elements is, is, is a tough road to hoe because you're trying to prove a negative, which is always hard. <laughs> so I don't want to hazard a guess of how we would prove that we're seeing population three stars. I mean, one, people have thought about <coughs> looking for POP3 supernovae and a sufficiently long near cam exposure would show them but the real gotcha is that time dilation makes them stay bright for a very long time. And so that's a little, not in, if we last 25 years, it's not impossible, but it's dicey. And Peter, Peter has a question here. I'll let him ask while you pass the microphone around and I'll repeat what he asked. I will yell it out. So, uh, if these are whole galaxies just consumed by star formation and, and being very efficient, uh, have you calculated how strong the uh, shock excited molecular hydrogen line would be in, and whether you could see that if you use that as one of your filters? Um, so we would have to be looking for, m for those with MIRI, and no, we have, I have not done a very careful calculation of that because, you know, these are shifted by a factor of 10 in wavelength, and so we, the, the two micron line would pop out at 20, and that's where things, where the zodiacal background is starting to come up, and it makes life really tough, because otherwise that'd be a great scheme. <laughs> That might be fairly definitive, but um, as good as Miri is, it's still living in the relatively near Earth environment with this horrible Zodi background and getting to it. Thank you very much. So, uh, near the beginning, you mentioned that there's five instruments that are kind of side by side in the focal plane, and I think you said NIRCAM is in the center of the field of view, or near the center of the field of view. So are the optical aberrations roughly similar for all these instruments, or have there been some priorities made about what goes in the center, and maybe the other instruments don't need so much resolution, or? Um, MIRI doesn't need so much resolution because it, work, it doesn't start operating until five, it operates five to 28 microns, so it doesn't need it. Near cam got pride of place because it's the wavefront sensor, and it was preferred to try to get that as close to on axis as possible. All of these are on, off axis instruments because of this three mirror and a stigmat design with the fine steering mirror. And w one thing that was a little bit tricky is that near cam had to be made almost optically perfect so that any aberration in near cam would not imprint itself on the other instruments because it's ar arranged the t mirror segments to match it. Um, and the guider um, and nearest, both of them um, chose to optimize their field of view by, by using um, the long wavelength Mercad Telluride and the same pixel scale that NIRCAM has in its longer wavelengths, so they're not sampling, they're undersampling the light for some of the wavelengths, and so they also didn't have quite as high optical requirements. Near spec, um, its smallest slit is a tenth of an arc second wide, which is um, like uh, three NIRCAM short wavelength pixels. And it purposely didn't um, sample quite as finely because it's read noise limited, so they decided, again, to use um, a bigger spatial scale. And so they're, they're somewhat more sensitive to aberrations because then the slit losses do tend to go up. But um, 
near cam is the one with the smallest pixels at any wavelength, so we're there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, an engineering question, sorry. Uh, I think you mentioned that the mechanical lubricant was going to be a significant concern in the lifetime of the instrument. Uh, so is that a transition metal doped molybdenum disulfide? And yeah, is it's it moly, we use moly disulfide. And in fact, we had to um, make certain that the near cam mechanisms were always kept dry using dry nitrogen and so on. And even then, you know, we tested it to um, twice the goal lifetime. So we actually did an accelerated life test of our filter wheels that would be equivalent to something like 20 years of operation. And they, they didn't fail, but we don't know for sure how far they could go. And so are your concerns about their lifetime impacted by like launch vibrations or by just radiation general, damage? Just, just general use. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. On the other hand, the, the detectors will suffer some cumulative cosmic ray damage, although I don't, from our testing, I don't think that will be a significant detriment. But. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also kind of a question about the lifespan of the instrument. With, a, let's say, up to a sort of 25-year lifetime, do you anticipate web being more statistically limited in the sense of just you always want more time to look at more targets or systematically limited because at some point we'll get everything we can get out of the sensitivity that it has? Oh, the sky is a pretty big place. <laughs> so I suspect that people won't run out of ideas. I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope has been going for more than 30 years, and guess what? People are still finding good things to do. And so I'm, 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 I feel confident that people won't run out of ideas. <laughs> And just very briefly, the other thing I was wondering, once it runs out of fuel and can't maintain station keeping, is it immediately useless, or as it slowly drifts away, can we still use weapon? It would It would um, slowly drift away, and I have not seen the estimates of how quickly it would drift away, but there will, I think it doesn't take too long for telemetry to, to the ground to become a problem, whether that's a couple of months. Um, the other thing is that if we don't um, have some fuel left to um, get rid of the built-up angular momentum in the reaction wheels. We also can't control the pointing very well. So there's several reasons to worry about the fuel. Thanks. But yay to Ariane Space for giving us such a good launch. <laughs> if, um, if you were allowed to redesign a instrument to go in pride of place of near cam today, what would it look like? I think it would look a lot the same, but I would have to ask for a bigger detector budget because I would like to have more pixels to be able to critically sample the shorter wavelengths better. But there's no novel solid state detector technology that's substantially better? Not yet, not yet. And there have been, um, since we finished the near cam design, there have been some more clever ideas for how to null out the, the starlight to do coronography. And there could be uh, particularly things like the nearest um, non-redundant mask that you just put in um, a spot in the pupil wheel and having the freedom to use one of those instead of our Leo stop kind of cor coronagraph. Now that we know that the image quality is so good, something like that might be well worth it as well. But the basic idea of having a beam splitter, a short wavelength arm, a long wavelength arm, and two fully redundant modules I would keep. Mm. That looks like most of the questions, and there were lots of them. <laughs> Suresh, thank you. Mm. To our speaker is Marsha, thank you very much. Omar, thank, thank you very much. <laughs>to all of you thank you thank you for coming thank you for bringing your curiosity thank you for bringing your questions nearly endless questions i think in you is the evidence that science really is social so thanks very much and have a great summer